we, we, we are the practice. And we, when we walk in the world, when we walk in the world, we literally are a, a divine spirit radiating and resonating to other divine spirits. And sometimes we'll create a practice that simply uh, activates that, activates that divinity in us. So it's a cosmological drama being explained through mythology, being implemented into the consciousness through rituals, and being carried on as custom, something that is repeated by a group of people over time to represent principles, concepts, and ideas. At this point, you've got religion. There's a lot of ways the spirits have helped me. I drive a cab. And every day before I get in the car, I say a prayer to the spirits and ask them for guidance and for help for that day. And I know they protect me at all times in this, in this cab. When I serve the spirits, there's certain days where I have to light candles for them. Sometimes I have to put some food out for one of the spirits. And sometimes I have to make a little table for them and put out candy and what have you, different things that they would like. Voodoo, as far as I'm concerned, is the original black man's religion. And once you get into it, you get a sense of security, especially living in a city like New York, where you have all kinds of things around you. You have all kinds of negative things around you, and the least thing you need to do is to get into them. Since the spirits help you so much, where do people get this idea that Voodoo is sticking pins and dolls? It must be Hollywood. That's one thing I could say. It's got to be Hollywood. You know, through ignorance and Hollywood, and I don't know, I don't know. I've, I've never seen a so-called voodoo doll. And I think, I know, Karen, I know you've been through a lot of different ceremonies, and I don't think you've ever seen them either. No. So I don't know where they get that idea of voodoo dolls. I wish they were voodoo dolls sometimes. <laughs> Voodoo has been, throughout the years, a very adaptable religion. Wherever it goes, it adds new elements, which does not water it down, but adds to it and makes it greater richer than it had been. So let, let, let's juxtapose the spread of Christianity in Africa with the spread of Islam in Africa. Um, were they different and how so? <laughs> The spread of Islam in Africa uh, was primarily by sword. The spread of Christianity was by peace. They talk a lot about the transatlantic slave trade, but the trans-Saharan slave trade began around in the ninth century. And in effect, while it was officially supposed to have ended, in reality, that slave trade has not ended at all. This is exactly what's going on in places like Libya and Sudan uh, and in uh, parts of Nigeria today. When we were on the slave plantation, our slave masters named their slaves after themselves. Here we are, 100 years up from slavery, still wearing the white man's name. It's very interesting for uh, a Muslim, especially a nation of Islam uh, adherent, to say, I'm dropping my slave name and adapting a name like Muhammad. I get that Smith and Johnson are indeed slave names. But in fact, Muhammad and, and Khan and all of these kinds of uh, Arabic names represent slavery for a longer period of time and a more devastating impact on Africans 
than the transatlantic slave trade, which only lasted a quarter of the time of the uh, trans-Saharan slave trade. Christianity and the spread of Christianity in Africa took nothing culturally away from Africa. And it introduced nothing culturally uh, that was not, that could not be contextualized to Africa. But Islam is a complete uh, Saudi Arabian import. There is nothing about Islam that is African in influence, but that cannot be said of Christianity. When one looks at the first six centuries, one will see that Africans are accepting Christianity voluntarily. Uh, matter of fact, um, by the 300s uh, in the fourth century, uh, Ethiopia, which is an independent kingdom at that time, it is run um, by Ethiopian monarchs. Um, they embraced Christianity on their own. In the fourth century, there, were, there was a Syrian missionary named Frumentius who shared the gospel with the king of Ethiopia, whose name was Ezana. And Ezana believed the gospel and he embraced Christianity as the national religion of Ethiopia. And it's been that way consistently for the last 1700 years. They, they have a large army. Um, they are, are not trying to find in any way to um, use Christianity as a means of, of getting protection from someone else. Um, they, they stand on their own two feet as it were. Ethiopia, which is the only African country to never have been colonized and has been an, an independent black African nation for, uh, for the entirety of its history, has also been a Christian nation, one of the oldest Christian nations in history. Many Muslims are under the impression that that first hijra uh, was from Mecca directly to Medina. Uh, that is incorrect. Uh, the, the first hijra or flight was from Mecca to Ethiopia. Ethiopia always had a special place in the heart of Muslims and still does. What makes Nile Valley uh, culture and civilization so important whenever we're talking about the origins of the world's major religions or our quest for spirituality is the fact that in the Nile Valley, that's where we have the most written documentation of our quest to understand our relationship to the Most High, our relationship to the divine, our relationship to the universe. It's in the Nile Valley where we have the first true expression, scientific and cultural expression of human beings attempt to understand divinity and their relationship to the cosmos. So if we look at the spiritual system of ancient Kemet, the oldest records of anybody understanding the science of this planet comes from Kemet. Our ancestors in the Nile Valley, in Nubia, Kemet, and Kush, they documented all of their scientific findings very, very thoroughly. They show you that they are on, on the descent of lineage, that they had a council of esteem uh, ancestors that they kept in contact with. They had a council of esteemed elders and which helped make decisions for the Nasu. And then they had uh, a, a divine rulership. And then they had divine elders and priests that carried this out. And then they had a protective system to be able to defend what they had. And we're missing many of those things to death. The significance is that you can find moments in that Nile Valley story that's been uncontaminated as an African inspiration. I'm using inspiration rather than civilization as an African inspiration because it inspired human beings to engage in their understanding of reality, uncontaminated. If we look at the Nile Valley, we find systems that are thousands of years old, thousands of years older than Judaism that talked of ways that human beings could manifest this God force the natural. Each temple 
was organic. That's why even today we have the seed stone or the cornerstone. They were treating the building as like an organic building that grew. So this was important. The columns were based upon the formula of pi, 3.14. Uh, we had pi and phi, which showing the golden spiral. And so each temple has the formula of golden spiral in it. So that means when they made the column, it was imitating nature. The principles of life in the universe so that they can build structures thousands of years ago that human beings are incapable of building today. So that they can understand astronomical and cosmological phenomena that astronomers today are just now beginning to identify and are dumbfounded by the fact that there is evidence today that Africans in the Nile Valley knew this information more than 10,000 years ago. We knew the speed of light. We knew the circumference of the planet. So we had to understand the heavens. We understood the first star charts that we see come from ancient Kemet. Uh, so we understood the heavens, we understood that, and we projected that energy on the planet. Humans looking, staying up in the world, walking the world in ancient times, it inspired a manifestation of a new and inspired the way to build buildings, inspired the way to have families and relationships, inspired the way to, to contemplate and to, 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 to look inside themselves and see God. Vodou has been, throughout the years, a very adaptable religion. Wherever it goes, it adds new elements, which does not water it down, but adds to it and makes it a greater richer than it had been. When the slaves were brought to Haiti, the French missionaries felt that it was very important for them to convert the slaves from their African so-called superstition to, uh, to Roman Catholicism. Uh, it also uh, gave a rationale for slavery altogether because the thought was that it was better for an African to remain a slave and to be saved by Christianity than it was for him to remain in a so-called dark continent and when he died he would go to hell. And therefore hundreds of missionaries went to the French colonies to convert the slaves to Christianity. But instead of giving up their African religions, the slaves established a kind of a marriage of Catholicism with their African religions. One finds this to have taken place primarily with the Catholic saints. For example, Dambala has always been associated with the serpent. When the missionaries came, they began to talk about St. Patrick chasing the snakes out of Ireland. And so on the basis of the snake in the story about St. Patrick, correspondence was made between St. Patrick and with Dambala in Dahomey. Graph here that is shown of uh, St. Patrick chasing or ordering the snakes to leave Ireland was immediately interpreted by the slaves in the 18th and 19th century to mean that St. Patrick was Dambala. And so if one goes through the various Vodun symbols, this is the case with all of the Vodun pantheon. The association between the African god and the Catholic saint is made on the basis of these various symbols in both religions. Vodun is a religion which has, in its history, always been persecuted. There have been periods where the Catholic Church has interpreted Vodun as a bastardized version of Roman Catholicism. And so we find that more than six or seven times, the Church has rallied the army, the police, and they've gone throughout the country specifically for the purpose of finding Vodun temples and burning all of the ritual paraphernalia used in a Vodun temple. And if one were to go back to the time of slavery, Vodun was completely outlawed. There are stories of people whose ears were cut off for practicing Vodun during the slave period. And because of that reason, the people have really never wanted to admit that they were Vodunists. Now, religion should be uh, considered as something open, but at different time of history, they've had to face 
powers that have tried to crush it. And I could think of many, many times either to a different Maroon society in Jamaica and uh, fight for independence in Haiti, where you actually have to be part of a conspiracy in order to survive as um, a, a group and also in order to worship. And uh, of course, the French colonizers did not appreciate blacks coming together. So you had to be part of that conspiracy too to survive. And therefore, voodoo was always kept underground. Even today, voodoo continues to be exploited. Certain individuals have taken advantage of voodoo's underground status to use it for their own greed and selfishness. They practice sorcery or witchcraft, calling it voodoo. And this has given the religion a bad name. In ancient Kemet, we have the 42 laws of Ma'at. They had 42 districts in ancient Kemet to go along with the 42 laws of Ma'at. And which the Hammurabi codes and Judaism, the Ten Commandments, all that comes out of that. And that was already ancient. Let me say this. That was already in existence in ancient Kash before Kemet even came into existence. In the African traditions, Throughout, if you, this, as we see this tradition emanate in ancient Kemet, if you look at it in West Africa with the Ewe, who have a word which is voodoo gadza, it means the essence of man as God. And what they say in this tradition, in the, the Ewe people of Togo and of Ghana, they say, and they say that they migrated from the East. They said that they speak the language of ancient Kemet. And so they said the tradition they practice is the ancient Kemetic tradition. And this is what they're saying today. Diop, Dr. Diop from Senegal said, we're not serious about African studies or the understanding of African people unless we connect ourselves to the Hopi Valley and ancient Kemet and Kosh. So I've taken that verbatim. 